Welcome to the NTEB Prophecy News Podcast with your host and Bible teacher, Jeffrey Greider. Rightly divided, dispensationally correct, and standing on the authority of the King James Holy Bible. This program is brought to you by NowTheEndBegins.com. And good afternoon, happy Friday everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Prophecy News Podcast today. Here are 10 signs that your church has already incorporated the New Age and the occult into their worship services. You know, when churches get off of the King James Bible and when they stop preaching and teaching Bible doctrine, a certain type of spiritual hole is created, one that absolutely will be filled by something. Why will people not endure sound doctrine? Because sound doctrine makes too little of you and too much of Jesus Christ, and your flesh absolutely rejects that paradigm. What happened to the scribes and Pharisees when they watched Jesus perform miracles? (laughs) It drove them insane. Is your church already embracing the New Age with things like the anagram? Let's take a look and see. Uh, Luke 6.11 says, And they were filled with madness. And communed one with another uh, what they might do to Jesus. Why were they filled with madness? Uh, We're going to talk about that today. On this episode of the Prophecy News Podcast, in thousands and thousands of churches across America and around the world, the Jesus of the Bible has taken a back seat to the universal Jesus of the New Age. Very little scripture is used, old-fashioned Bible preaching virtually non-existent, and overemphasis on the Holy Spirit is made. And of course, there is enough music to make Woodstock look like a street corner musician. Now, you might be tempted to say, hey, that's not happening in my church. But you just might be very surprised how much of the New Age is already present in your church. Today, we look at 10 New Age things that are absolutely part of the occult to see not if, but to see how many of these things are in your church right now. And look, Christian, even if your church has none of the things on our list today, it's a guarantee that you know somebody whose church is doing these things, and it's going to be up to you to warn them. All this and much more today on the Prophecy News Podcast. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and your mercy. We thank you, God, for all these that you've gathered here today. Uh, Lord, it's uh, exciting to see the chat room filling up and thousands of people tuning in from all over the world. And uh, Lord, our listenership is up 40%. And uh, we thank you for the increase, Lord, and we just pray, Lord, that you would let us stick by the book and stick with the old paths and and uh, uh, have, the, have the old Bible doctrine and sing the songs of Zion. And uh, Lord, let us not switch, let us not change, let us <laughs> endure to the end. Heavenly Father, uh, we pray for Annetta this morning who had a stroke last year, almost a year ago, and uh, we're praying that she... Uh, has a complete healing so that she can get out of that wheelchair and walk again. Robert Wiley has ALS disease, and we're praying for him and his wife, Lisa. We have ladies who are expecting babies. Elena Blackburn, Kelsey Emerson, Erin Riddle, Gary Tatterson's daughter, Kayla. Um, And we pray that the Lord would keep his hand on those babies, those moms, those dads, and bring everything to fruition. Um, Jeanette's cousin Andrew had a stroke and we're praying for him Rob Beatty's colon cancer has come back and we're still waiting for a report from uh, Dina's mom Marcy Long uh, she had colon cancer took some chemotherapy and we're waiting for the results of that to come back so we're praying that she'll get a good report Mark Saxa would like prayers for his son Joseph that he would return for the Lord uh, to the Lord Um, Clayton Perry is suffering the uh, side effects of chemotherapy and cancer. Uh, Craig Arford and Harmon's son Michael battling pancreatic cancer. Aaron Riddle's sister Tracy has metastatic breast cancer. Jill Puckett is asking for prayer because she's losing her vision. 
Catherine B. is on dialysis and has um, some some heart stent issues, and we're praying for her, and it's good to see her in the chat room today. Uh, Matt is in urgent need of salvation, and Sarah Shine, we're praying for her three kids, Nicole, Sherry, and Scott, and um, uh, she also has some health issues. Carol Jane is in the hospital until March, and she needs our prayer. Uh, CJ's mom needs to get saved. Maddie Luck says, uh, I have been diagnosed with Luli body dementia. And please keep her and her daughter in your prayers. Also, um, uh, Kathleen and her daughter Kayleen Schnorr. Um, Kayleen lost her dad and Kathleen lost her husband. So please keep uh, Kathleen and Kayleen Schnorr in your prayers. Uh, Aunt Nancy is asking for prayer for Brandon and Michelle for salvation. Unspoken prayers, uh, Amanda and Mike, the La Piana family, Jeanette, Marie C., Adrian P. Breda, Cheryl H., and we've been praying for Chris Hart, who has a time-sensitive unspoken, uh, and he sent me a very excited text message yesterday saying that uh, his unspoken prayer has taken a giant step forward towards being fulfilled. So please continue to pray for Chris Hart and his time-sensitive unspoken prayer. Um, Rebecca Lynn is asking salvation and healing for Joel Smith. Uh, Jill is having um, heart valve replacement surgery in a couple of weeks. Please keep her in your prayers. Kevin Thompson Wants prayer for finances, lawsuit, career change, and gospel track success. Angela's mom for healing and salvation. Deborah Shular, uh, health issues after getting a parasite. Charlton's wife, Debbie, uh, eye surgery on March 20th. That's 10 days from today. Keep that in your prayers. Yasmina, uh, please pray for my daughter's um, godfather in the hospital with lung cancer. Leslie needs the Lord to rule and overrule in a financial situation. And the Lord knows what the need is, but keep Leslie in your prayers um, that uh, God would order and reorder um, her current financial situation. Pat Burns, um, please pray for me. I have an important prostate test today, and we've been praying for him all week. And uh, Pat, if you're listening, uh, please give us an update after you go to have your test today. Uh, Dan's mom in Norway, Ellen, has severe arthritis and is taking chemotherapy for it. Uh, And we are praying for Ellen to have a healing from arthritis. And uh, we have listeners all over the world, and I praise the Lord for that. Rachel in New York, Dan's girlfriend, been trying to get a new job, and she has an in-person interview on Monday. Please remember Rachel in New York. Um, Steve Wilder, uh, please pray for my stepson, Daniel Taylor, baby Ezekiel's dad, to be put on the prayer list for Vertigo episodes, and... Baby Ezekiel is doing very, very well. He's up to 5 pounds, 11 ounces, and will be able to go home from the hospital very soon. Um, So we rejoice with the Wilder family, and please remember his stepson, um, Daniel, uh, for vertigo. And please drink a lot of water. If you suffer from vertigo, I'm not saying that drinking more water is a cure, but a lot of the times... Dizziness can happen when you are dehydrated. Dr. Shirley says, pray for me. I have indigestion and other health issues. May they be healed in Jesus' name. Amen. And that's exactly how they will get healed. Um, Kyle Gorzell just got off the phone with some family members. Chemotherapy for Uncle David is not working. They're stressed and concerned. Uh, The family has been asked to travel to Texas. And to see a new doctor. So please keep Uncle David <clears throat> in your prayers um, regarding chemotherapy. Uh, Marie Comfort says, uh, please put Pastor Bert on the prayer list. And um, uh, he had a heart attack and he almost died. And she says, he likes everything that I send him from now the end begins. Amen. So please keep 
um, Marie Comfort's pastor, Pastor Bert, uh, in your prayers. Um, I did all the unspokens. I did the praise report. Let's see in the chat room. Noah, I have a nephew in prison right now that I'm trying to help. He's my youngest brother that died of um, cancer, uh, his son. I'm retired, and there are so many. Oh, I'm a retired Leo, law enforcement officer. (laughs) I've gotten so much better at acronyms since we started doing this prayer list a couple of years ago, uh, because a lot of the times when people will say, please pray for my daughter-in-law, they'll just simply say D-I-L. Um, or S-I-L for son-in-law. And I don't see these prayer requests until my mouth is already speaking them. So sometimes when you hear me giving the prayer request and I kind of like stop in the middle of it and there's a few moments of silence because sometimes I have to interpret the rather colorful um, uh, artistic liberties taken with the English language. Um, but Noah is a retired law enforcement officer, and there are so many families with relatives incarcerated. Um, re- I have an update on the Bibles Behind Bars program. Um, his name is Michael, and this is his first time in jail. I uh, hope he learns to walk a straight line. And Noah, if you're listening, um, please go to, please tell his chaplain to go to Bibles Behind Bars, and we'll send some Bibles out. Julie Baird, uh, but it's BiblesBehindBars.com. Julie Baird, please pray for Grandma Wilma. She is 85 and has COVID. The family is very worried. Make sure that you're giving her zinc, quercetin, vitamin C, and D3, about 10,000 international units. And, of course, we will continue to pray. Karen from Delaware, please pray for me as I have nine exchange J-1 students this summer. Wow. Um, Pray God will give them a softened heart to prepare them to have eyes to see and ears to hear his word and to accept him as their savior. Amen. Jill says, please keep praying for my husband to be willing to attend the camp meeting. And we're praying for Stacy's husband as well um, to be willing to attend the camp meeting. Um, but pray for Jill's husband and Stacy's husband. Jericho, unspoken prayer for me too. <clears throat> Karen says, prayers for my sister Sharon. She's having eye surgery today, uh, and we will pray. Jose, please keep my mom in your prayers. She's having, um, she's having the 23rd of this month cataract surgery. Please pray for God's hedge of protection Amen. Heavenly Father, for all these prayers and for the unspoken prayers of our hearts, uh, we just pray, Lord, that you would work and move and heal. And God, you are a miracle-working God. And we don't need to have signs, miracles, and wonders. We can come boldly before the throne of grace, crying, Abba, Father. And we know that you hear our prayer and you answer our prayer. And Lord, we ask you to heal all these on the list. Um, Some really, really tough things. Um, COVID is like the least of these prayer requests. And COVID can be really, really bad. Um, There's so much of a need, Father God. And we pray that you work and move. Heal that which... Uh, needs healing and repair that which is broken reconcile lord you say that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation and we pray lord for everybody who needs to be reconciled to each other or to you that that would take place and father god we thank you we praise you we commit this time to you and uh, we give you all the glory for you are worthy In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Well, welcome, everybody. Glad that you're here today. We have a big show. We've had a lot of big shows lately. I just checked our stats uh, right before airtime, and uh, listenership is up a full 40% as of 10 minutes ago. And uh, we are reaching people in 140 different countries. And we're so glad and we're so excited. Um, Yesterday, I got a phone call. And some of you may remember this guy. 
His name is Robert Day, and he goes to Calvary Chapel. And um, the reason why you might remember him is back in 2021 when we had, um, oh, what hurricane was that? It was that really bad hurricane that was on the west coast of Florida, like the, the, the southern west coast of Florida. I can't remember the name of the hurricane, but um, one of you will, and it will come to me <laughs> sooner or later. Um, but, uh, oh, here it is. I got the article. Um, a man by the name of Robert Day had heard that we have a free Bible program, and he just wandered into the bookstore one day. I think he called first and spoke with Miranda, if I remember correctly. I could be wrong about that. But I'm pretty sure that he spoke with Miranda at the bookstore or somebody at the bookstore last year. And um, <clears throat> he said that he was going down to the Hurricane Ground Zero. And he wanted to know if he could take some Bibles with him. And so we loaded up Brother Day with about five cases, about a hundred Bibles, and um, we also gave him about 1,200 gospel, nope, nope, I take that back. We gave him a hundred King James Bibles, and we gave him 5,000 NTEB gospel tracts, um, and we also, uh, yeah, okay, we gave him 5,000 gospel tracts and 100 King James Bibles. That's five cases of Bibles. And um, he went down there and uh, the Lord blessed his efforts and gave him great success. Well, he called me yesterday and said that a friend of his was just appointed as chaplain of a, of a jail and... Um, I don't remember the name of the jail, but his chaplain friend is going to be reaching out to us through BiblesBehindBars.com. And I'm so excited. I have so many updates on the Bibles Behind Bars program, and I'm trying hard to get these updates to you. Um, but just suffice to say that we are supplying thousands and thousands and thousands of Bibles to jails and prisons all around the world, and the number of people is increasing on a weekly basis who are asking for Bibles. So uh, please pray for the Bibles Behind Bars program, our free Bible program, um, and Lori's going to put the link into the chat room uh, where you can donate. Uh, if you want more information about our Bibles Behind Bars program, just go to BiblesBehindBars.com. Um, and we invite you to donate and to help us to reach even more people. And God is blessing it to a wonderfully high degree. Uh, I was in the bookstore, I want to say it wasn't yesterday, it was two days ago that I was in the bookstore and um, sitting there talking with somebody and while I was at the bookstore, this Ukrainian man walks into the bookstore, goes right to the front where we have the Ukrainian New Testaments, and I knew that he was Ukrainian because he was wearing a a a um, uh, like an olive green shirt that had a military patch on the right sleeve, and of course, when he started to speak, I could hear the. Uh, he had a rather heavy accent. And so he wanted to know if the Ukrainian Bible was for sale. I said, yeah, we sell them, but we also give them away if you need them. And so he asked me, well, I do have some Ukrainian people that could use Bibles. And he said, could you give a couple of hundred Bibles? I said, brother, we just sent last year 12,000 Ukrainian New Testaments to missionaries and nationals living in Poland. I said, you just tell me how many Bibles that you need. <laughs> Cheryl H. just said, you were talking to me. 
I knew I was talking with somebody, but technically, Cheryl, I think at the exact moment that he walked in, I was talking with your husband. But you are a thousand percent correct. Cheryl H. and her husband were in the bookstore last week, and they were there, and they saw the Ukrainian man come in. And I said to him, I said, brother, we'll get you as many Bibles as you need. There was a time, and I'll get to the podcast in just a minute, but just bear with me. There was a time where I would tell people, we'll give you as many Bibles as you need, and then the sweat would break off under my hair, under my collar, in the back of my shirt, and it would drip down my back because I would say to myself, can we really provide 2,000 Bibles? Can we really provide 1,600 Bibles? Can we really provide that amount of Bibles with the shipping? And God has shown me over and over and over again where I don't take it for granted, don't get me wrong, but I have come to trust that this is what God has for us to do. The free Bible program and the Bibles Behind Bars program, look, I'm holding in my hand right now, and let me just reach behind me so I'm not lying, I am physically holding in my hand right now a magazine called Redeemed. And it's a magazine for prisoners. And I'm going to just put a picture of that magazine into the chat room. This is a super glossy um, five color magazine. And it's beautiful. And it's, it's done by this woman in Texas. I was introduced to her uh, from Bill Grady. And there is this ministry in Texas that for the last 20 years has been going hardcore with their prison ministry. And we are about to connect with that ministry. And we're, Lord willing, we are going to supply their Bible needs. And these people have been doing it for 20 years, maybe even longer. And I am so very excited Um, So when I say that I have like all these updates that we're working on, we have some (laughs) some really big updates and God has us so busy. I sometimes forget to talk about it. That's how much stuff is going on. I just put a picture into the chat room uh, for the redeemed magazine and it's 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 beautiful and it's filled with articles by Bible believers, King James Bible believers. So uh, we are connecting with that ministry and we are going, Lord willing, (laughs) we are going to be supplying their Bible needs. And uh, who was it that just said, well, uh, Rob says, I think we might hit that million. Um, I believe with all my heart, we're going to hit that million. We're past 120,000 now. That's right. I said we're past 120,000 King James Bibles, New Testaments, and Scripture portions. Uh, And uh, we just give all the honor and glory to the Lord for that. But look, we need your help. We need you to pray. Um, D.L. Moody was used by God to bring revival to England twice. And it all started with an invalid woman praying in her bed. So we need prayer just as much as we need the finances to be able to do this. 50-50, maybe even more important, is the prayer. Um, But we need prayer, and we need people to donate. Look, I know that... um, There's a lot of people who listen to this broadcast, and God has blessed you to a very high degree. We ask you to donate and be as generous as you possibly can be, Um, because that's what it takes. Uh, It takes takes about a million dollars per year to hand out over 100,000 Bibles with the shipping. 
Um, so uh, that's what it takes. And that's what we need to raise. But praise the Lord. That's coming in. That's what we are raising. So please pray for the free Bible program. Um, you know, we have a bookstore. God told us to have a bookstore, so we have a bookstore. People just walk in. Ukrainian people, come over to Macedonia and help us. Isn't that what they said to the Apostle Paul? God has put us in a very unique position. Uh, Jericho says, I haven't seen any way to earmark donations for the Bibles Behind Bars program. Just send it in, brother. Just send it in. Um, uh, there's no need. There is no need to separate it. I promise you, I promise you that uh, the amount of Bibles that we need to send out outpaces the giving. And the giving is very good. But... Um, God is increasing the amount of Bibles uh, that we need to send out, that we are sending out. So all you have to do is just send it in, and I promise you it will get to where it needs to go. Um, and uh, that's what the Lord has us doing. So there you have an update on Bibles Behind Bars. But look, I love the Bibles Behind Bars program, but we also have the free Bible program. If you're a listener and you need a study Bible, but you can't afford one, go to BibleBeliever.com and we'll send you one. Now, we only send out about a thousand of those Ruckman reference Bibles every year. And that doesn't seem like a lot when you compare that to the 105,000 that we sent out last year, mostly to the um, Bibles Behind Bars program. But when you realize that that's a thousand individual people in about 20 different countries who are personally requesting an individual Bible, that's a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, so we need you to support the free Bible program, the Bibles behind bars program. We're getting ready to put up some new billboards. Um, so we're doing it all. We're absolutely doing it all. Um, all right. And there you have it. And for those of you that do pray uh, for this ministry and who do financially support us, we are eternally glad and grateful that you do. And you have our and my uh, undying thanks and gratitude. Jose says, did you guys see the recent video Marco from being justified put on concerning NTEB? I actually did. I think it was Kathy Kelly who sent that to me. Uh, let me just take a quick look over on Facebook. I Maybe it wasn't Kathy Kelly. Hold on a second here. Somebody sent me through Facebook and it was a graphic that they had put together. Oh, who sent me that? Anyway, somebody sent me through Facebook. Did you see what they're saying about you with the pre-trib rapture? Um, that type of stuff doesn't bother me. It does not bother me. Uh, Kimmy D says, I send my tithe to this church with no specific program because I know it will go where it is needed. Uh, Pastor G does not need a plane. No, I don't. I don't need a plane. Uh, the Bible says this, having food and raiment, let us be content therewith. The Lord woke me up this morning. I had a very delicious bowl of steel cut oats with banana and strawberry. Uh, there was breath in my lungs. There was praise in my lips. There was a thought in my head and my heart was beating um, I'm way ahead of the game and you are too. If God is supplying the, the basic needs and necessities of your life, uh, we serve a good God. He's great. He's a great God, but we serve a good God and he is good. Uh, all right, let's get started with the podcast today. Um, and we're going to make a lot of people mad today, but that's okay. We don't mind. We really, really don't mind. 
Um, let's start with 10 signs that your church has begun to embrace the new age. And so I took some time this morning and I wrote out 10 bullet points, which will be in the notes that Jeanette is going to send out. So don't worry about, uh, you know, you don't need to have them right now. But if if you get the notes that she sends out with, with the... Uh, um, with all the programs that we do, then you'll have these 10 bullet points. And I'm not going to do them in any particular order. Uh, so the first thing that I want to talk about today is um, something called the law of attraction. The law of attraction. And this is taught primarily in the word of faith churches. But it is taught in some charismatic churches, some Pentecostal churches, and it is taught in a lot of the large non-denominational non churches. Uh, we have a church here in um, Jacksonville called Celebration Church, and um, they are a, I, I don't know if I would call them a charismatic church, but they certainly lean very strongly to the charismatic side of things. And um, I'm not saying that all charismatics have false doctrine because that's not true. But a lot of them do. And a lot of them have false doctrine and they don't even realize that they do. Now, let's talk about Joel Osteen. Uh, Joel Osteen wrote a book called The Power of I Am. Now, that is blasphemous on multiple levels. But once, once you get past the blasphemy part, what Joel Osteen is teaching and what they teach in all the word faith churches is they teach something that is um, you can call it the law of attraction. You can call it positive affirmation. Um, and maybe if I said the law of attraction, you might say, nope, we don't do that at my church. Well, do you do daily affirmations? Do you look in the mirror and do you say positive things to yourself? Are you aware that that is right on the borderline of the occult. Now, you might say, wait, that's the occult just because I have a positive attitude? No, I didn't say that. I said doing daily affirmations is a New Age practice. How do I know that? Because I was in the New Age movement as a Roman Catholic for many, many years. I know about the New Age. So, does your church encourage you to do daily affirmations? Well, if it does, if it does, um, then that is borderline occult practice. Now, I realize that I just offended about 18% of everybody listening right now, but I want you to think about it. There is no such thing as a daily affirmation in the Bible. Nobody in the Bible needed to do that. Turn to Proverbs chapter 3. And I'm not just going to give you my opinion. <clears throat> I'm going to give you Bible today, like we do every time. Proverbs chapter 3. <clears throat> Let's look at verses... Um, hmm. Let's start in 5. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Oh, here it is. And lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. When you do daily affirmations, you are leaning into your own understanding. You are, you are looking into the mirror. Or listening to the sound of your own voice. And you are leaning into your own understanding. 
You are acknowledging yourself. But Proverbs 3, 6 says, In all thy ways acknowledge him. Uh, what's that old hymn? Uh, Cast your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world shall grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The Bible says that we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart, not trust in ourselves, not trust in our good works, not trust in our good name, but we are to trust in the Lord with all our hearts and to seek his understanding, not our understanding. How do you know that when you do your daily affirmation that you are not affirming something that God is against. Have you ever stopped to think about that? What if the things that you're saying in your daily affirmations are against the Bible? Do you think God is going to bless that? No, he's not going to bless that. So let's take a listen to what it sounds like when the leader of one of America's largest churches is practicing New Age theology. Here is Joel Osteen preaching the power of I am. I want to talk to you today about the power of I am. What follows these two simple words will determine what kind of life you live. I am blessed. I am strong. I am healthy. Or I am slow. I am unattractive. I am a terrible mother. The I am's that are coming out of your mouth will bring either success or failure. All through the day, the power of I am is at work. We make a mistake. I am so clumsy. We look in the mirror. I am so old. We see somebody very talented. I am so average. We get caught in traffic. I am so unlucky. Many times we use the power of I am against us. We don't realize how it's affecting our future. Here's the principle. What follows the I am will always come looking for you. When you say, I am so clumsy, clumsiness comes looking for you. I am so old, wrinkles come looking for you. I am so overweight, calories come looking for you. It's just like you're inviting them. Whatever you follow the I am with, you're handing it an invitation opening the door, giving it permission to be in your life. Now, the good news is you get to choose what follows the I am. When you go through the day saying, I am blessed, blessings come looking for you. I am talented, talent comes looking for you. You may not feel up to par, but when you say, I am healthy, health starts heading your way. I am strong, strength starts tracking you down. You're inviting that into your life. All right. I don't know how much more of that I can listen to or subject you to. But do you hear what he's saying? On what basis is any of those things true? If you're lying in bed with cancer and a number of the people on our prayer list are dealing with cancer... Is it really a cure for you to start saying to yourself, I am healthy, when in fact you are not healthy? So, why does Joel Osteen do that? Joel Osteen does that because that is something called the law of attraction. And there are millions and millions and millions of people who are his followers. And not only that, He is not the only one that does that. So, um, the first thing that we're talking about today, uh, 10 signs that your church has begun to embrace the new age and the occult is the law of attraction and positive affirmations. You do not have the power. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Turn to Genesis chapter 1. Chapter 1, you do not have the power to speak things into existence. 
Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light. Now, who is able to speak things into existence? God. Who is the one that created everything? Turn to the book of Colossians. Turn to the book of Colossians. Um, it said that the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Um, have you ever looked in your Bible to see who the Spirit of God is? Now, you might say to me, well, that's a silly statement um, because um, the Spirit of God is the Holy Spirit. And that's true. But keep your finger in Colossians chapter 1 and turn to 2 Corinthians 3.17. 2 Corinthians 3.17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, capital S. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So, Genesis chapter 1 says the Spirit of God began to move upon the face of the earth. Paul says Jesus is that Spirit. Um, Colossians chapter 1. Verse, let's start in verse um, 15. Colossians 1, we're going to do 15 through 18. You know who Jesus is? He's God, manifest in the flesh. He is God the Father, manifest in the flesh. And before you call me a heretic, uh, just read Colossians 1.15, talking about Jesus Christ. Who is the image of the invisible God? We could stop right there. Is Jesus Christ God the Father in the flesh? He absolutely is. If he's not, Paul is a liar. Colossians 1.15 Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And then verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Now, I said all that to say this. You do not have the power to speak things into existence. Now, your church may teach you that. But that is a lie. You cannot speak things into existence. Now, you might say to me, well, what about Adolf Hitler? Adolf Hitler spoke things into existence, and he brought the entire world into war. Yeah, but he couldn't speak victory for himself. He died a coward's death. He, assass he assassinated himself in the bunker. Speaking things into existence is something that only God can do. Only God. You cannot do it. So, if your church is trying to give you positive affirmations, uh, why don't you just read the Bible instead? Read Proverbs. Read Psalms. And uh, you'll get all the wisdom that you possibly need. Now, if you want to affirm anything on a daily basis, what you can do is you can affirm Scripture. That you can do. I love when I'm riding it in the car 
to memorize new scripture verses and to see how much of John 14 I have memorized, how much of John 3 I have memorized, how much of 1 Corinthians 15 or Titus chapter 2 or how much of uh, uh, Acts chapter whatever. If you want to affirm something that will give glory to God, then why don't you just affirm Scripture? How about that? Um, so, if your church is teaching positive affirmation, regardless of what they call it, that is a church that has begun to embrace the new age, has begun to embrace the new age. Um, uh, here is the second heresy. Here is the second heresy. Uh, it is called the universal Christ. Have you ever heard about that? Now, again, you might be very tempted to say, nope, there's nothing in my church called the universal Christ. Well, let me tell you what it is, and then you tell me if it happens to be in your church. Let me ask you a, f a couple of questions. Did people get saved back in the 1970s with the Jesus movement? Yes, some people did. Are some people getting saved in the Asbury revival? Yeah, some people are. But the bulk of the people from the Jesus movement and the bulk of the people from the Asbury revival are not getting the Jesus Christ of the Bible. What they're getting is the universal Christ that you don't need theology. You don't need doctrine. What you need is to have an experience, right? Now, let me see if I can find that clip of Tony Palmer. Um, let's take a listen to this. This is not really the clip that I want to play, but I'm going to play it anyway. Take a listen to Tony Palmer talking about the miracle of unity. Uh, and it's a miracle that takes place not from the Bible, but by experiencing what Tony Palmer called the glory. We are living in an incredibly important generation. I believe that God has brought me here to this year's Minister's Conference in the spirit of Elijah. Let me explain. If you look carefully... The spirit of Elijah was on John the Baptist to turn the hearts of the sons to the fathers and to turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons to prepare the way for the Lord. And we know that prophecy always has a double fulfillment. And we know that Elijah will come before the second coming as well. And I've understood that the spirit of Elijah is the spirit of reconciliation to return hearts to each other. This is very important. We know that the first thousand years there was one church, it was called the Catholic Church, and the word Catholic means universal, it doesn't mean Roman. Catholic means, if you're born again, raise your hand if you're born again. You're a Catholic. <laughs> so, step number one, if you're born again, you're a Catholic. Now, remember, Tony Palmer is not giving this speech in the Catholic Church. Tony Palmer is giving this speech in a Christian church in Kenneth Copeland's church. Take back, redeem what belongs to you. We are Catholics. And then there was the split at the end of the first millennium. We had the Orthodox, East and West, two churches. Then 500 years later, we have Luther and his protest. Three churches in 1,500 years. Three denominations, not three churches. And then, from Luther's protest onwards, 33,000 new denominations. I've come to understand that diversity is divine. All right, it's here it is. Division that's diabolic. Listen. It's true what you were saying about the glory. I agree with you, of course, it's true. 
the glory that the Father had, he gave to Jesus. The glory was the presence of God. What is the charismatic renewal? It's when we experience the presence of God. And he said, and I give them the glory, pragmatic reason, so that they may be one. It's the glory that glues us together, not the doctrines. It's the glory. If you accept that Christ is living in me and the presence of God is in me and the presence of God is in you, that's all we need. And right there, what do you have? You have the universal Christ. You have a Jesus that is not brought out by Bible doctrine, by Bible preaching, by Bible teaching. What you have is lip service being paid to the Scripture and then, once you nibble on that hook, and it's like, oh, he's talking about the Bible, that must be preaching. No. Tony Palmer just told you that we don't need doctrine. What we need is the glory of a experience with Christ. So, this is not the Christ of the Bible. This is what the New Age people call the universal Christ. Now, there was a woman back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s by the name of Catherine Coleman, and she was instrumental in bringing this type of experiential Christianity to people. When she met with Pope Paul, she said this, when I met with Pope Paul, there was a oneness. If you remember a couple of weeks ago when we were doing the program on the New World Order and the One World Religion of Chrislam, and I played those clips from Billy Graham where he's talking about the oneness that he felt with Pope John Paul II. How is it possible that Christians can feel oneness with a pope when we have Bible doctrine that absolutely separates us. Well, you got to get rid of the Bible doctrine if you want to have unity. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Paul says, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, 2023, when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And what will this do? And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Um, that's exactly what Paul is talking about in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 with something that he calls the falling away. Now, Catherine Coleman, and I'm going to play a clip of her, and I want you to listen to it. She's very creepy, and every time, if you've ever seen that old black and white movie called Sunset Boulevard um, about the life of um, silent actress, um, silent screen actress, uh, Gloria Swanson. And um, uh, very dramatic, very stylized movie. Uh, but um, that's what Catherine Coleman sounds like. And back in the 1970s, this clip is from 1971. And she is preaching to a very large room filled with the Jesus people. If, uh, if you've heard about that movie, the Jesus Revolution movie, uh, that is about the Jesus movement and the Jesus people uh, of the early 1970s. So take a listen to Catherine Coleman with the Jesus people. Have you experienced Christ? You see? Chuck and Dwayne, that's what makes the difference. There are some who may call themselves Jesus people and use the name of Jesus, but it makes all the difference in the world whether you've had that new birth experience. It's the changed life. This is the thing. That's right. 
this is the thing. That's what makes the difference, uh, the difference between a kick and an eternal experience. Right. Right. A couple weeks ago, uh, I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and I was talking to this young man, and he told me that he was 15 years old and that for the, about the past two years or so that he had been on the road since he was 13, and he had tried everything. And, he... and just so you know, the man speaking is Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel. He knew what he had to do in order to live out on the street. And uh, as, as we were talking about it, he, he also then started to tell me a story that I could hardly believe about his home life. And as we were talking, and I shared with him just a little bit of the love of Jesus Christ. And then I asked him if he would like to pray with me and invite Jesus to come into his life. And he said yes. And so right there on the street, right near Hollywood and Vine, we just bowed our heads and, and, and he... So I'm going to stop that right there. That's Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel talking about how he invited a, a teenager to... He asked a teenager if he would like to invite Jesus into his life. That's not how people get saved. You can get saved that way, but that is not biblical salvation. That is not, we are to believe the gospel. Is not about inviting Jesus into your heart or Jesus take the wheel and all that stuff. Um, it's about being convicted after the preaching of the gospel. Prayed. And he invited Jesus Christ to come into his life. And all of a sudden, yeah. his whole face just changed. His eyes started to twinkle and he had a smile on his face for the first time as I was talking to him. And then I, I invited him to come down to our office, which is just about three blocks off Hollywood and Vine. And as we were getting close there, I asked him if he would like to call home. He was from Phoenix. And he said yes. And we went into the office, and he dialed the phone. And the first words he said was, Mom, I'm coming home. And you know, this is the changed life. Something immediately happens. We might not be able to describe it in words with words, but yet it happens. And that's the new birth experience. Something when you invite Jesus Christ into your life, Something happens. That is not the new birth experience. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Um, it is the preaching of the gospel. It is the receiving and hearing of the gospel. But we'll get to more, the, more of that in just a minute. Tom. Tom. <laughs> How old are you? 23 Have you had that experience? Yeah It's marvelous, isn't it? Beautiful What was it like before? It was terrible <laughs> <laughs> Terrible Have you been on heroin? No, I, I never got into heroin I got into LSD and, and the devil kind of took me that way for a while. What made you get on? Well, I, I came from a, a family where I, I just didn't get any love and I needed it and so I tried to get it from my friends and they were on drugs so I thought I might get accepted by getting into drugs too. But I, I wasn't, it wasn't in there either. Where are you from? A Danny. I grew up in Danny. But it didn't satisfy, did it? No. No, it just made me even more empty and more lonely. <coughs> what is the feeling? Tell me, Tom. <coughs> what is the feeling, the loneliness, mm -hmm. before you find Jesus? What is it like? It's like, well, I know that almost everybody's felt that sometimes you can feel it when you're around the most people. I could be in the middle of a crowd and feel so alone just so unwanted and unrecognized and so insecure and it's just a, a deep hollow feeling just one that would drive me to anything to fill it anything and when night comes is it worse oh yeah yeah lots of times i it it just overwhelmed me 
really terrible, really dark. How did you happen to find Jesus? And I, I don't mean just how did you happen. It doesn't just happen. Uh, it's Jesus there all the time waiting for you. Always. There it is. It doesn't just happen. It's Jesus is all the time just waiting for you, just lurking in the shadows like he has nothing better to do. Um, She's talking about an experience. Now, this guy is going to reference the Bible very briefly, but he is, to his credit, he is going to reference the Bible. But then the, the two people after him is the real reason why we're listening to this clip. That's it, too, and... A long time ago, I never knew my parents weren't religious or anything, or they didn't know the Lord or anything, but somewhere I picked up a scripture that said, even those that believe on his name, and through everything, I always said, Jesus, if I don't find my love here, my happiness here, Jesus, I know that if I believe in your name, eventually, sometime, you'll bring me home, and he did. One day, it's, and I knew... Jesus just opened his arms and he just said, you know, I love you and it's just me and and I'm all you need and he is all that I needed. Again, there is no testimony of I was a sinner. There is no testimony of this scripture convicted me. There is no testimony of I heard the gospel being preached uh, and I came down and I went to the altar and I, I prayed to get saved. None of that. He changed my life. He, he made that loneliness go away. It's never there anymore. Jesus is a constant friend, a constant friend. He's always with me, and he loves me a lot, and I know it because I feel it. It is a definite experience. Definitely. He said, I know it because I feel it. What happens if your feelings change? Definitely. Tom, it isn't just another kick with you, is it? Uh, no it's way. It's a person uh, It's Jesus. He gave me, I didn't have a family, but now I got a huge family. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, I know what you mean. I've never been a mother, but all these wonderful children... <laughs> Oh, honey, come here. Come. Just slide over. (laughs) Just slide over, honey. Just slide over. Jesus is wonderful. Oh, yes. (gasps) And it's a real experience, too. It's more than an experience. It's there for life. It's there for life. If only we could tell the whole world, you know. I just wish you could. (laughs) I want everybody to know how wonderful Jesus is. I know. He's there all the time. He's there all the time loving us. And this is just the beginning. There's all of eternity. (laughs) Oh, honey, come here. Come. (laughs) Come on, scoot over. Come on, get real close over here. Now, if you were to see the video, the girl that she's going to talk to now is shaking and crying. And um, listen to her testimony. We love him, don't we? I sure do. (laughs) And he's real. And when we pray, he hears us. I sure does. <laughs> and the most wonderful thing is that he knows all about us. He knows our joy. He knows our sorrow. He takes us in his arms. And keeps us there forever. I know forever and ever and ever. Do you understand or do you understand? <laughs> there are thousands, thousands living who do not understand. But this, this is real. As the very son of the living God 
as real as God himself. You see, this is my life. It always will be. There's nothing else. Just us. And the cameras. And those wonderful people out there in the dark. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. That's Gloria Swanson from Sunset Boulevard. Sounding exactly like Catherine Coleman. Um, So, point number two out of our ten points. Is your church embracing the new age? Well, if your church is preaching a experienced base theology they are dealing in the new age if they are telling you about the universal christ that is the occult because that's what the new age teaches so that's point number two the universal christ um let's see how about this Have you heard of something called the Enneagram? Some of you may have heard this, of this, and some of you may not have heard of this. But during the pandemic, and you know what? A lot of this junk really started catching fire during the lockdown and during the pandemic. Um, If I was a believer in conspiracy theory, wink, wink. I would believe that this was all intentional, uh, which is a rhetorical statement to make. Um, We did an article back in 2019, Charismatic and Emergent Churches Embracing New Age Paganism as a Cultic Practice of the Enneagram is Replacing the Teaching of Bible Doctrine. Now, here's a clip from Bethel Church. And there's a lot of churches that are influenced by Bethel Church. Here is uh, founder Bill Johnson's daughter, Jen Johnson, promoting from the pulpit. I guess she's a co-pastor and she's a preacher and whatever else. Uh, Take a listen to Jen Johnson at Bethel Church promoting the Enneagram. Pretty yellow. Got it. So this year we've come into this swirl, this swirl of life. (sighs) And I realize my capacity, you know, with every season, your capacity changes again. It it doesn't work. Old manna isn't going to fill your belly and nourish you for the next season. You can't wear your old shoes into the place that we're going. And I, um, I could feel the Lord shifting us. I could feel something that had to happen in me. I was like, I have the opportunity to give into this fear, to give into this swirl, to feel all the things. If you're like me, um, being raised a ministry kid, but also, I'm going to say this one thing and then I will leave it be. Is anyone in here into the Enneagram? Okay. If you don't know what that is, love you all. Love all the numbers. If, if you, if you don't know what that is, unless you're willing to study it, leave it be. Leave it be. So Jen Johnson just said, and she was addressing herself to the people who are not in favor of the Enneagram, and she just told you that if you're not on board, that you don't have a voice and your opinion doesn't count, and if you watch the video, she's dismissively waving her hand while she's telling you to just let it be, meaning... If you're not on board with the Enneagram, then you don't have the right to participate in the conversation. Let alone. The Enneagram, I'm a one. So I'm, I'm the personality type that's a perfectionist reformer, all right? I like to lean towards reformer. <laughs> um, but anyways, understand that my wiring, I, I, can, tend, I can tend to want to save everything. I can tend to lead toward, lean towards wanting to be the strong one. Being a pastor's kid sometimes, not all the time, you get used to 
being the answer. But it's not. Melissa Helser, I'll God love her. God love her. She looked at me one day, sat down, looked me in the eyes in my car. All right, that's enough of Jen Johnson from Bethel Church. But, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the Enneagram. We've spoken about it before. We've written about it before. The Enneagram is witchcraft. It is the occult. It has nothing to do with the church. If your church does it, you need to rebuke it. And if they will not accept your rebuke, you need to leave your church and find a Bible preaching church. The Enneagram is witchcraft. Case closed. Uh, that's exactly what it is. So if your church is practicing the Enneagram, then um, you are in a bad church. You're in a church that is practicing witchcraft, which brings us to our next point. Uh, Ten signs that your church has begun to embrace the new age. If your church is embracing the new age, there will be an overemphasis on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, also called the Comforter, was sent by Jesus to do the things that are laid out in John 16. Turn to John 16. He is a messenger of the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches that put too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit take away from Jesus Christ. As worshipers begin to seek a mystical encounter or experience. Now, John chapter 16 tells you exactly who the Holy Spirit is. John chapter 16, and let's look um, verses uh, uh, 12 through 14. John 16, verses 12 through 14. Jesus says, I have yet many things to say unto you. But ye cannot bear them now, howbeit when he, the Spirit of Truth, capital S Spirit, of Truth is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. That is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why you've got to be very, very, very careful if you're in a church that puts too much emphasis on the Holy Spirit, this is what you wind up with. Take a listen to Rodney Howard Brown, and the title of his message is called Time in the Holy Ghost. Take a listen to Time in the Holy Ghost, Rodney Howard Brown, 2023. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. Fire of God. Fire of God. Fire of God.
So there you have Rodney Howard Brown. Um, and the clip that we posted, and we posted it two days ago on Twitter, it's been viewed 9,282 times in the last 36 hours. And it has a whole bunch of comments. I want to read to you a couple of the comments. And I'm going to put the link into the chat room. Uh, for those of you who are on Twitter, you can go see that what I'm telling you is the truth. Um, there were about 80 people that commented. Here's a woman by the name of Calissa Harris. And she was at Rodney Howard Brown's church when a very similar thing took place. This is her testimony. While I was on the floor, God showed me how much he loved me. I felt the laughter and God healed me from all past hurts and all I felt was joy. I know it was God because it made me seek him more. If it was the devil, it wouldn't have made me more in love with God. So, she was at Rodney Howard Brown's church. She experienced that. And she went on Twitter to defend it. Uh, a woman by the name of Dolly Bowen, very mad at me. She says, I will no longer follow you. This is the Holy Spirit, not Satan. Uh, let's see if I can find another um, another couple of comments. Um, most of the comments would agree with our position. Um, but there are people who, um, uh, they listen to that junk and they have no discernment of any kind. Um, here's somebody by the name of Real Time Redneck. She says... In all my half century of following Christ and his word. Um, oh, no, no. She agrees with us, too. So uh, there's not that many people who responded that. Thought that what Rodney Howard Brown was doing was a good thing. But when you look at the video, Rodney Howard Brown has an enormous church. He is a multimillionaire. People send him unbelievable amounts of money. And um, he is doing this wacky, crazy, uh, demonic, holy laughter. Uh, they call him the Holy Ghost Bartender. And he got that name because his followers would roll on the floor. They would bark like dogs. And he would say that they were drunk on the Holy Spirit. Uh, being drunk is a sin, um, and and uh, the idea that he is dispensing this to people is absolutely terrible. Um, so, if you're in a church that puts an overemphasis on the Holy Spirit, you are in a church that has begun to embrace the occult and the New Age. Um, and here's one that you may or may not agree with, but I'm going to give it to you anyway. The vast majority of the modern version Bibles are infused with New Age references. Did you know that a open lesbian was on the translating committee of the, um, the NIV Bible? A lot of people aren't aware of that. Did you know that almost all of the modern versions like the NIV and the ESV, they remove dozens and dozens of verses about the blood, about the deity of Jesus Christ. That is a passive aggressive new age tactic. And one of the best books that you'll ever find is actually called New Age Bible Versions. And of course, we sell that book at the bookstore and we invite you to go to BibleBeliever.com and get yourself a copy of Gail Ripplinger's excellent book, 
New Age Bible versions. And uh, you'll see in great and graphic detail um, how how bad things really, really are. I don't have time to go into that, um, but get yourself a copy of New Age Bible versions and you will see what is behind these modern Bible versions, the NIV and the ESV and all those other ones. And now I understand when I say that if your church doesn't have a King James Bible, they have begun to embrace the new age. But that is, by definition, that's true. Because the modern versions are absolutely dipped in the new age. So if your church is not preaching and teaching from the King James Bible, um, that is a church that has already begun to uh, embrace the new age. Uh, here's another one. Here's another one. Um, if you're in a church that is inviting you to imitate either Jesus Christ or the apostle Paul, his handpicked representative, you are in a church that has begun to embrace the new age. Um, second, Second Thessalonians chapter three, verse nine, second Thessalonians three, nine in your King James Bible um, says this. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. Now, Paul is not calling you to imitate them. He is calling you to follow them. Have you ever been to New York City? Have you ever walked down Fifth Avenue or down Broadway? Have you ever seen the people selling the Rolex watches for 20 bucks or the Gucci handbags for $35? A handbag that cost $1,200? Those things are called imitations. And they are not real. They are fake. An imitation is something that is fake. It is not real. And so if you are in a church that teaches little gods that uh, when you got saved, you are now a little god just like the big God, that is 100% an occult teaching. Take a listen to the little God's heresy. Do you know what else that settled then tonight? This hue and cry and controversy that has been spawned by the devil to try and bring dissension within the body of Christ, that we are gods. I am a little God. Yes. Yes. I have his name. I'm one with him. I'm in covenant relation. Yes. I am a little God. Critic, you are God. anything that he is. Yes. Now, in verse 26 and verse 27, God now submits himself to this principle of everything producing after its own kind. And in verse 26 and 27, let's read it out loud. Ready? Read. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him male and female created he them. Now that's interesting because of everything produces after its own kind we now see God producing man. And if God now produces man and everything produces after his own kind if horses get together they produce what? And if dogs get together they produce what? If 
cats get together, they produce what? But if the Godhead gets together and say, let us make man, then what are they producing? They're producing gods. Now, I got to hit this thing real hard in the very beginning because I ain't got time to go through all this. But I'm going to say to you right now, you are gods, little g. You are gods because you came from God, and you are gods. You're not just human. The only human part about you is this physical body that you live in. You know, why do people have such a fit about God calling his creation, his creation, his man, not his whole creation, but his man, little gods? If he's God, what's he going to call them but the God kind? I mean, if you as a human being... All right, so you have Kenneth Copeland, Creflo Dollar, Joyce Meyer, and everybody else in the charismatic Word of Faith movement that teaches the heresy that when you got saved, you became a little God. That is absolutely the occult. <clears throat> that is absolutely the New Age where you are transcending to a godlike state. And again, the Bible says nothing about you being a little god. Um, when you have time, open up an electronic NIV or ESV Bible and type in the word imitate <clears throat> and see what you come up with uh, you'll come up with places like 1 Corinthians 4.16, where Paul is saying in the NIV, therefore I urge you to imitate me. Just remember that an imitation is a counterfeit of the real thing. And if you don't think that that's true, if you think that you're supposed to be an imitation of Paul, now, that's a Roman Catholic teaching from St. Thomas Aquinas. And I think he even wrote a book called The Imitation of God. I could be wrong about that title. I haven't thought about it in a long time. It just popped into my head. Um, but, but um, no, it wasn't St. Thomas Aquinas. It was the other one. Oh, what was his name? Called The Imitation of Christ. Anyway, that's a Roman Catholic teaching. And what is it doing in the NIV Bible? What is it doing in the ESV Bible? Does your church teach the New Age? They do if you have an NIV. Does your church dabble in the occult? They are if they're using the ESV Bible and they're calling Christians to imitate Paul and imitate Christ, that's a lot of counterfeit Christians that they are creating. So we've only gone through about half of our list, and maybe we'll do a part two of this on Monday, or maybe we'll, we'll, we'll uh, just move it to the next Bible study. But suffice to say that I really think that it's important. Now, why did I play a clip of Catherine Coleman and Chuck Smith from 1971? Because the things that were put in place in 1971 are still happening right now. They just released a movie based on the Jesus movement. That clip that I played with Catherine Coleman and her scary voice, talking about experiencing the universal Christ. That movie is playing in the theaters right now. So forget the fact that the clip that I played um, is over a half a century old. The things that that wrong theology put into place are absolutely taking place right here and right now. And um, we'll talk more about this on other broadcasts. Um, but I hope that this was a blessing for you. And I hope that it opens your eyes that the occult and the new age is a lot more subtle 
than what you think it is. And it is highly likely that your church is dabbling in many of these things right now. Um, Nevada Dreams just said that male was not Chuck Smith's voice. Um, Hold on a second. I do like to address things when people talk about them. Um, I'm going to play just a minute of that clip. I'm going to play just a minute of that clip and I, and I will hold on a second here. Um, we have somebody in the chat room who says that I was falsely accusing Chuck Smith. Take a listen. You see, Chuck and Dwayne, that's what makes the difference. There are some who may call themselves Jesus people. And use the name of Jesus, but it makes all the difference in the world whether you've had that new birth experience. It's the changed life. This is the thing. That's Chuck That's Smith. Right. This is the thing. That's what makes the difference, uh, the difference between a kick and an eternal experience. Right. Right. A couple of weeks ago. That's Chuck uh, Smith. I was walking down Hollywood Boulevard and I was talking to this young man. And he told me that he was 15 years old and that for the, about the past two years or so that he had... Ben. So just to address the concern that popped up in the chat room that I claimed that that was Chuck Smith talking and it wasn't Chuck Smith, this is Chuck Smith from Calvary Church. On the road since he was 13 and he had tried everything and he knew what he had to do in order to live out on the street. And uh, as, as we were talking... So there you go. And hey... I can make a mistake just like anybody else can make a mistake. And sometimes I'll remember something wrong or I'll have the facts, you know, not right about something. Uh, And you bring it to my attention and I'm very happy to correct it. But that was absolutely Chuck Smith. And he was absolutely hand in hand with Catherine Coleman. And, um, you know, this is where that universal Christ comes from. It comes from the Jesus movement. But you know what? We're out of time for today. So thank you for tuning in and being part of the NTEB global family of Bible believers uh, across America and around the world. Lord willing, we'll see you back here Sunday at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for another NTEB House Church Sunday service. Have a great weekend, everybody. Sin I was living, no thought was I giving of dying and where I would go. I was looking and buying, so hard was I trying to gain all this world had to hold. No peace and no pleasure could I even measure with all that I had to gain. I repented and prayed, Christ saved me that day. Now I have got something to say. I'm not going to hell. I met the Savior, what a story I tell. I'm saved and forgiven, set free, all is well. I'm not going to hell. No, I'm not going to hell. Since I've been forgiven, Christ made a real change in me. I'm no longer crying when I think about dying, cause heaven is waiting for me. Now Satan's still lying, he's always trying to lead you down the wrong way. Just call on Christ's name, he'll save you today, then look back to Satan and say, I'm not going to hell, I met the Savior, what a story I tell, I'm saved and forgiven, set free all is well, I'm not going to hell, no, I'm not going. Savior, what a story I
I tell I'm saved and forgiven Set free, all is well I'm not going to hell No Joy is complete for I'm saved, and I'm not going.